Hello and good morning. I want to welcome you to Arrested and Free with the Sheriff's Daughter program. My name is Julianne Harris and I have been arrested by God's goodness, His grace, His love, and His mercy. And I've been set free from fear and pain, anxiety, discontentment, and all the negative things that happens to us in life. I've been set free from. Yeah, I have. And a special shout out to my dad in northeastern Montana, who is a sheriff there. So yes, I am a sheriff's daughter. So that explains the title of my program. Praise God. So today is June the 7th in the year of our Lord 2020. And I am so thankful that you're tuning in today. I prayed uh, quite a bit trying to figure out what to talk on today because, man, this world is crazy that we're living in. And um, I like, do I keep going down the law versus grace? you know, grace, like, the, you know, Moses bringing the law and why God brought the law to the Israelite nation? Or do I uh, talk about our current situation in this world? And, and so <clears throat> I thought that what I would do is just mention something that uh, will give you all something to chew about, chew on, think about, meditate on in regards to this country. And here is what's going on, you guys. We are facing, it's good versus evil. And evil just brings more evil. And so we're seeing that. But here is my heart of what needs to be done in this time. Okay, so if we go to Matthew, no, in John chapter 13. Let me just take you there right quick. In John chapter 13, verse 35 Actually, verse 34, let's read that. And it says, a new commandment, this is Jesus speaking. These are Jesus' words, okay? So they, I would say they're fairly important. If it's in red, it's important. So in John chapter 13, verse 34, it says, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Here's the key verse, verse 35. It says, by this, by what? What is he talking about this? He just mentioned what this is, and that's your love one for another. Shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another? So you're like, oh, okay, so the answer is love. Yeah, the answer is always love. I mean, even the world knows that. If you watch Wonder Woman, what does she get super powerful at the end? Because of love. Love overcomes everything folks so it's not just love but it's love one for another and I am talking about the body of Christ I am talking about your fellow believers in Jesus Christ what we need to do as a body of Christ is stop fighting and bickering and and squabbling with one another we need to come together as the body of Christ and withstand evil that means standing up for Judeo-Christian beliefs and standards, meaning abortion is wrong. You know, um, murder is wrong. There's just some standards that we need to set and we need to stand together instead of fighting and bickering over small, it's not always small, but over these different issues. Jesus said, this is how the world, people will know that we are his disciples. That's how you set apart. That's how people are going to know that you are a Christian. It's not by beating people down with the Bible, with the law, with all that stuff. It's by our love one for another. And I'm telling you, sometimes the hardest people to love are fellow Christians. And I know I'm guilty of it too. Because you look and you listen at what they're saying. And listen, I am guilty of, of talking about hearing pastors and stuff like that um, talk about the talk wrongly about the nature of God. And it, and it does frustrate me, but guess what I didn't do is I didn't go onto their YouTube channel or their Facebook page and start ranting and raving and telling them how he, they're messed up and crazy and stupid. No, in this time, in this day and hour, folks, we need to come together as the body of Christ. We need to pray for leadership. We need to vote for Judeo-Christian beliefs. We need to not vote for people that, um, that are for abortion. 
that are for these things that are so contrary to what being a Christian is, to God is life, God is love. Um, so we just need to come together as a body of Christ and stand, withstand evil, and we can do that. That is what's keeping evil at bay, but we're not doing a very good job of it, are we? That's why we find ourselves in the condition that we're in. So I don't have all the answers, but I do know this. As far as among the body of Christ, among people who have believed and confessed with their mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to stop fighting with one another. We need to come together as the body of Christ, agree on what we can agree on, and we need to pray we need to pray for this nation and for the hurting people that are out there. So I would just encourage you. That's what I have to say about the issue is that I'm not putting other people down, other believers down. I never have. But we need to come together as the body of Christ and stop fighting and bickering and um, arguing. Jesus said, this is how people will know that you're my disciple is your love one for another. So if you're not loving somebody in your church, somebody in the body of Christ, instead we are tearing them down, putting them down, doing all this stuff, we need to knock it off. We need to knock it off. We need to have a, a supernatural love one for another, and that will speak volumes to people. That will speak volumes to people. So I would encourage you folks, um, I, don't, I don't even know if that makes any sense to you, but it certainly makes sense to me that we need to stand together as the body of Christ and withstand evil. Stop fighting with one another. Stop putting one another down. Stop doing all this stuff, convicting, calling out all this stuff on one another. Let's stand together. Let's have a supernatural love to where people go, whoa, you, there's something different about you folks because you love one another. <laughs> And a lot of churches, if you know, <laughs> I know a lot of churches where people get along better at the bar than people get along at the church. And they're, that's wrong. It's so wrong. So let's get back to uh, the law. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Such a fun subject, right? So I'm just trying to uh, nail this down as far as we need to know that we know that we know that the law was brought to the Israelites, to the Hebrew nation. It wasn't even brought to us. It was brought because it was Abraham's promise that this nation was going to be set apart. And like I talked about last week, so that it might go well with them. Listen, the law is holy. It is a perfect law of God. And if you follow it, if you abide by it, it will go well with you. And it was a covenant that God entered into with the Israelite, with the Hebrew nation. It's not even intended for Gentiles. It's not even intended for us. But isn't that how it is? That the law has been pushed down our throats in churches. Now now I'm feeling convicted like I'm putting down churches. I'm not putting down churches, but I'm, I'm trying to give you a different perspective so that you can walk free from sin, that you can walk free from guilt and condemnation, that you can walk free in the true freedom that you have in Christ Jesus. We were never intended to be justified in our vertical relationship with God, in our relationship on whether or not God is pleased with us. The law was never it. It never was. So let's get into this a little bit, but we got to see that it was a covenant entered into. I touched on it a little bit last week. So if you have more questions about that, please go back and watch last week's episode. But I'm going to show you specifically from Exodus where the Israelites entered into this covenant with God. So it's in Exodus chapter 3. No, chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. So let's go there right quick. And no, these are not scriptures that I know off the top of my head. They're not stuff that I uh, are, is my go-to. So uh, Exodus chapter 3, or Exodus chapter 19. And let's look at this. They're at Mount, Mount Sinai. I'm just going to read through this a little bit because this is when 
the law comes. Okay, so in the third month, when the children, this is in verse 1 of chapter 19 of Exodus. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they unto the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from that place and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel. So God says, Moses, this is what you're going to tell him. Ye have seen, this is verse four, ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on the eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my commandment, ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. God was saying, I want to set you apart. I've brought you unto myself. I've brought you out so that you can be a peculiar people unto me. Man, he was wanting relationship, you guys. This is our God who is love. He didn't bring him out to, to bring some law to be killing people. No, he said, I want you to be a peculiar, special people unto me. And it says in verse 6, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And verse 8 says, And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Isn't that amazing how <laughs> they said all the laws, because this is after the law was brought, um, they said all that the Lord has spoken we will do. Yeah. We're entering into covenant. They're spitting on their hand and they're shaking God's hand. Okay. Also, they do it again in Exodus chapter 24. Let's jump over there. And then the covenant is affirmed. So in chapter 24, verse 3, and it says, And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord hath said we will do. Wow. They didn't realize how difficult it was going to be, right? Um, because of who they were at this point. Because they were just coming out of Egypt where all this stuff was rampant. They had no set plumb line of what was right and what was wrong. What was acceptable by God and what wasn't acceptable by God. But here we can clearly see God entered into this old covenant with the Hebrew nation. And the Hebrews, the Israelite, the Jewish people said, yes, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So here is the covenant that was set. So I just want to make it very clear. And this was radical to me because it was never intended for the Gentiles. But yet I grew up in church hearing the Ten Commandments and and that was what was taught when I was very little. And that's great. There are reasons for it. And I'll, I'll show you from the word why it's an okay thing to teach it as you're young. But what's more important is the love of God. We have to know that the God is love and that he loves us. I, I'm not a proponent of teaching the law in relation teaching the law to young children in relationship to from them to God that like God is judging you on this law no God is not judging you anymore because he put all judgment and punishment into the body of Jesus he is now he loves you so much and he has a purpose and a plan for you and guess what but God gave us a standard of what's right and wrong that's what you teach children and so you can then go through the Ten Commandments going, listen, God said there should be no other God above him. That's, that's a standard that you should live your life by. But guess what? God loves you no matter what, no matter what. You shouldn't steal. You shouldn't lie. You shouldn't do all of these things. This is God's standard. This is how God is. God doesn't lie to you. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is how we should teach children not 
God's going to be upset with you if you don't do this. If you lie, God will be upset with you and he'll, you know, you'll spend eternity in the lake of fire. <laughs> no, that's, that's not what you should be teaching your children. So that's what I heard growing up. I heard the law taught in my relationship to God, and it's just simply not true. It was never intended for the Gentiles, and the Gentiles uh, preach it a lot. But you know what's funny is, is that even though I heard um, about the Ten Commandments, what about all the other laws? What about, you know, at least the Israelites at some point had a reprieve of the guilt, guilty um, conscience and the mind because at least they had like sacrifices like you kill this bullock and you do this and that will cover your sins at least there was a reprieve or something that they could do to help them feel better but when you're teaching law to new testament new covenant believers there is no reprieve when you're saying you, if you break this law, God is upset with you, there is no reprieve. Because at least in the in the old covenant, they were like, yeah, God's upset with you if you do this because you've broken the law, but you can do this to cover that sin. And listen, all my life growing up, I heard you do this, God is upset with you, you got to get born again, again, you got to do all this stuff, but there wasn't. It, it never felt full because God wasn't judging me on it anymore. And listen, I'm not going to get into the new covenant, but there was no long, God, Jesus was that sacrifice. So God, that's how I can say God is no longer judging you on these sins in relationship to him. But listen, your sins will affect everything around you. So it's not God bringing judgment on you. But it's just the consequence of sin. Man, we, we understand this in every everyday things. But we think, well, God must be punishing me because I sinned. No, God punished Jesus for your sins. And if you could grasp it, if you could tweak that in your brain, you would live holier than you've ever tried actually trying to live holy. If you can focus on the love of God for you, you will live holier than you've ever lived in your entire life. So why did God bring the law? Let's look at that. And that's what I want to kind of focus on as much as I can today. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's go to Galatians because Galatians really, um, really makes this clear. And so I'm just going to lay out the two main reasons that God brought the law and I'm going to show you here in Galatians and confirm it in the word of why God brought the law. So number one, just want to make sure I'm staying intact with my notes. I got to stay on focus here. <laughs> so number one, God brought the law because of transgression. I talked about this last week. Sin was getting so out of hand. He had to slow it down because at this point, um, Things were just, sin was just escalating and getting worse and worse and worse. And now he had a people that he was planning on. It was a promised nation, remember? Because he promised Abraham that all the world, nations of the world would be blessed through him. So this, these are descendants of Abraham who have been shut up in captivity, in slavery for 430 years with no grasp, no concept of uh, that plumb line was skewed on what was right, what was wrong, because nothing had ever been laid out. Remember, because before the law came, sin was not imputed because there is no transgression when there is no law. So sin was not imputed to these folks, even though they were living in sin, they didn't know it was sin. So there's so many reasons why God brought the law. Number one, because of transgression, he needed to lay a plumb line and say, listen, this is right. This is wrong. This is right. This is wrong. Because up until this point, it's, it, there was nothing right. There was no standard of what was right and what was wrong. It was whatever they thought. Whatever the, the Egyptians told them was right, was right to them. Whatever the Egyptians told them was wrong, was wrong to them. And how many of us today in this society, in this day and age, are doing the exact same thing? 
We are looking, instead of looking in the word to see our standard and our plumb line of what is right and what is wrong, we're going by what society says. Well, you know, society says that homosexuality is okay. No, the word makes it very clear. That is not how men and women were created. It's, it's going against your nature. And, and it starts with something as simple as homosexuality, which is very clear, is not acceptable, is not what you were created for. It's less than best. Listen, does God love you if you're homosexual or practicing that lifestyle? Yes, absolutely. But it's very clear in the word of God that that is less than best. It's not going to go well with you. Listen, living in fornication, having sex outside of marriage is not going to go well with you. The Bible is clear on that. We have a plumb line and that is called the word of God. But how much, how many of us in the church is allowing society to tell us what is right and wrong? They'll, they'll call you a hater because you say that homosexuality is wrong. You're called um, a homophobic or whatever name you want to put if you don't believe in same-sex marriage. God, God laid it out. This is the plumb line of what marriage is. And marriage is one man and one woman. So we in the church, when we start taking on these ideas, we're no better than the Israelite people, than the Hebrew nation. When they came out of captivity, out of Egypt, they had a skewed image of what was right and what was wrong. There had been nothing spoken from God at this point until Moses comes and brings the law. So that's one of the reasons God brought the law was so that people would know a standard of what is right and what is wrong. And to have a standard so high that there was no way they could do it within themselves. Because guess what? Sin nature, you within your own flesh... You cannot adhere to the law. You can't do it. And here's another interesting fact. If we go over to, um, to Romans. Oh, is it Romans? Mm -hmm. I thought it was Romans. Anyways, oh no, it's in James. That's where it's at. In James chapter 2, verse 16. Hebrews, James. James chapter 2. I didn't think I was going to go here, so I apologize for the uh, delay. James chapter 2, verse 10. There it is. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all the law. He is guilty of breaking every single law. That is such a high standard, you guys, that there is no way you can adhere to the law in your own strength. So why did he set such a high standard? Why did God bring a law that it had such a high standard that there it was absolutely impossible for them to adhere to? So that they would need a savior. Look, God was setting, setting a stage for bringing in himself to save them. But listen, if you don't think, if you don't realize or think that you need to be saved, then how can a savior save you? Listen, you can be in a flood and going down and you're drowning, but unless you realize you're drowning, how can somebody come and save you? People were dying and, and <laughs> they were dying from sin. Sin was, was spiraling out of control. And the only way God could save them is by showing them that they needed a savior. And without understanding how unholy they were, how, false, how far short they fall from God's true standard, then they would never ask or look for a savior. But as you get further on the story of the Hebrew nation, as they tried to adhere to it, they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. There were people that thought they could do it, but they didn't realize that if you break one little law, then you're guilty of breaking all of them. It doesn't matter. And I love this analogy, so I'm going to go ahead and use it. 
but you can have a pane glass window, like a big, huge window, right? So if you shoot a, shoot a BB through it, it breaks it, right? Or you can drive a semi through it, it breaks it. It doesn't matter how you break it, it's broken. Whether it's with a little pebble, with a little tiny BB, or with it's a, if it's with a big semi truck, it doesn't matter, it's broken. And so how do you, how do you get through that? How do you get past that? You call on a savior and that's why Jesus came. Jesus was that savior to save them. But first we needed to set a standard. So God brought the law because of transgression. He needed to slow down sin. They were living like Egyptians. They, and, and they had been um, slaves for 430 years. They didn't even know how to rule themselves. So all they knew is everything, all the bad habits they got out of Egypt. And that's all they knew. They didn't know how to run themselves. And, and, and remember, the law was brought so that it might go well with them. Man, if you didn't listen to last week's sermon or last week's video, if you didn't watch it, you need to go back and watch it because it's absolutely amazing to see the law for what it was. It was so that it might go well with you. You don't murder, you don't steal, you don't commit adultery because that just causes pain and havoc not only on people around you, but on you so that it might go well with you, God said. That's why I'm bringing this. So he, he brought it. <laughs> I'm like, let me keep on my list here and keep an eye on my time. My goodness, where did the time go? And to show a need for a savior. So that's really where I ended it. I'm going to go ahead and um, read it from the word so that you can see, well, what he mean? It's uh, because of transgression. Well, if we look in Galatians chapter 3, verse 19, it says, Wherefore then serveth the law? It's saying, so what serves the law? What's the purpose of the law? And it says, it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. That seed was Jesus. Until Jesus could come, it was brought because of transgression. He had to slow down sin. He had to stop, stop all the sin. And then if you jump a little further in Galatians chapter 3, uh, verse 20, verse 22. Let's start there. It's 22 and 23. It says, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Verse 23 says, But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto faith, unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So I'll get into that later, uh, how we're no longer under the law. But in verse 24, it says there, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. God was ushering in the, the example that Abraham, Abraham was justified by faith. But listen, these, the Hebrew nation didn't know that. The world as a whole didn't know that. And God was going to bring it back around. But it wasn't just faith. It was faith in Jesus. So he had to bring the law for them to throw up their hands and say, you know what, I can't do this. This is too hard. There is no way we can fulfill all the law. And listen, that it did that to me for years. Not understanding, I was already justified through Jesus. Because Jesus was that one that we're to put our faith in to say, you know what, I'm right with God, not because I've obeyed the Ten Commandments or the 613 laws that come with the holy law of Moses. No, I am justified with God. I am right with God because of Jesus and my faith in Jesus and him paying the penalty and paying the price for all of my sins on the cross 2,000 years ago. That's how simple it is. But God had to bring the law to do that, to be a schoolmaster. I talked about it last week. So I would encourage you to go back and watch last week and then watch this week. But we got to understand these things, folks. We got to understand that, first of all, God brought the holy law out of love so that it might go well with you. 
If you would do that, even if you don't take anything else, if you look at the law and go, wow, if I could do each of these things, it would go well with me. That's why he brought it. Not, not to be angry or hurtful or upset. God's got plenty of things to do other than to just mess around. No, he was bringing it so then that we would see our need for a savior. That's what the law really works well at. Uh, <laughs> and I spent 20 some years um, letting the law wreak havoc in my life, understanding I need a savior, but didn't understand that I was no longer under the law because I had believed on Jesus. I already had the Savior. The Savior was living on the inside of me. The law no longer was the criteria on your on my relationship with God because I had already believed on Jesus. It's so simple. God made it so simple. But we don't understand these things. And so then when we look in the Old Covenant and how God deals with the Hebrew nation, then we think, well, that must be how God deals with me. No, it's an Old Covenant. And this old covenant is going to last for around 2,000 years. That's where I'm saying we need to look at the Bible as a big thing. We have 2,000 years before the law comes. Sin is not imputed because there is no law. Because where there is no law, there is no transgression. But because of the transgression that was happening, sin was happening before the law came. And it was killing people. But they didn't know it was sin until the law came. So God brought the law and said, here's our plumb line, folks. This is right. This is wrong. And this standard is high. Like God's standard for right and wrong is high. And they said, oh, no problem. All that you've said, we will do. We can do it. We'll do it. Don't worry, God. We can do it. And God's going, okay. So for 2,000 years, they try to adhere to this. And, and it's finally set the stage for Jesus to come in on the scene and pay, pay the price for sin. That sin that was brought into this world in the Garden of Eden. That was the plan from the very beginning. So, like I say, God is love, folks. God is not judging you today because we're in a new covenant. If you have believed on Jesus, God is no longer judging you based on sin. So I pray that you're understanding this. If you have any questions, please let me know. Please subscribe below. You can also send me a message here on YouTube. Uh, I'll respond to it. You can also find me on Facebook at Arrested and Free. Or I am on Instagram, Sheriff's Daughter Show. Or give me a call. Send me a text message at 970-919-0450. So I pray you guys all have a wonderfully blessed week. Be safe. Let's love on one another. You guys, let's practice it. Let's practice it first in Judea, then Jerusalem, and then to all the outer parts of the world. Let's practice on loving within our family. Let's practice on loving within our church. Loving one another with a supernatural love. Let's stop fighting and bickering and putting each other down. Um, we're not a good witness. If that's what you're doing, if you feel like you are called to tell everybody in the body of Christ where they are wrong, then um, <laughs> you're sowing discord among the brethren. And it's wrong. It's wrong. And you're a terrible witness to the people on the outside, the unbelievers looking in. We can't even get along in the body of Christ. And Jesus said, this is how you will know. This is how they will know that you are my disciple. Is your love one for another? So let's love one another, folks. And listen, when I minister, I, I'm just telling you the stuff that I hear. I don't agree with it, but I'm not getting onto their uh, website and onto their their media, social media, and, and letting them know and letting them have it and telling them how wrong they are. That is not what we need in this day and hour. So have a blessed week, folks, and make sure... If you subscribe below, that you will get notifications every time I post a new video. Otherwise, you know, every Sunday morning, you get a new video. So have a blessed week, and I look forward to seeing you next Sunday. All right, bye-bye.